twins are said to share a bond that can defy scientific explanation. Some say that the connection forged in the womb allows twins to feel another's pain or even communicate via ESP. For Ursula and Sabina Erickson, their bond took them on a bizarre trip, one that involved attempted suicide, superhuman strength, reality television, and even murder. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness Radio, where every week you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up this hour… In 1761, a young Frenchman died violently. This tragedy would lead to what is still one of that country's most famous cases of judicial injustice. Assuming, of course, that it truly was an injustice at all. Most know them as the Hidden Folk, the elusive and magical residents of Iceland who live inside rocks and sometimes play games with unsuspecting passers-by. Are they real? That's a complicated question if you ask Icelanders. As two boys were walking back to the house on their farm, a small stone rolled past them. Then a second one. They immediately thought some other boys were hiding in the scrub and throwing stones for a joke. They could not have been more wrong. But first, they're going to steal your organs, screamed Sabina Erickson before running toward oncoming traffic on the M6 highway, having already been hit head-on by a Volkswagen. Her twin sister, Ursula, legs crushed by the truck that had just run her over, was spitting and screaming at paramedics on the side of the road. Now, many years after these events, we are still no closer to understanding the chaos that occurred over two days in 2008 involving psychotic twin sisters on a UK highway. We begin there. If you're new here, welcome to the show. And if you're already a member of this Weirdo family, please take a moment and invite someone else to listen in with you. Recommending Weird Darkness to others helps make it possible for me to keep doing the show. And while you're listening, be sure to visit WeirdDarkness.com where you can follow me on social media, listen to free audiobooks that I've narrated, and more. That's WeirdDarkness.com. Now bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. The Swedish Ericsson twins made headlines in 2008 after a series of strange events took place in the United Kingdom. The truly bizarre story and its aftermath has left authorities and physicians puzzled. What exactly happened that caused the twins to snap? Did they really experience a shared psychosis? Ultimately, the only people who can know what happened to the Ericsson sisters are the sisters themselves, Ursula and Sabina but their strange case is darkly fascinating all the same. The Erickson sisters' strange trip began in May of 2008, when Ursula, who'd been living in the U.S. at the time, decided to visit her twin sister Sabina in County Cork, Ireland. Within 24 hours of her arrival, the two took a ferry to Liverpool. Upon arriving in the English port city, the twins paid a visit to the St. Anne Street Police Station to report concerns over Sabina's children whom she had left with her partner back in Ireland. From there, the Ericsson sisters boarded a National Express coach to London, where their behavior would take a more erratic turn. Not long after the twins boarded the coach to London, Ursula and Sabina began acting strangely. Reportedly, the twins had refused to check their bags and became enraged when the bus staff attempted to take them from them. 
The bus stopped at a service station on the M6 in Staffordshire, and the driver, who had been perturbed by their behavior, kicked the twins off. Sabina and Ursula, now stranded, started walking the M6 motorway. The road is not designed for pedestrians, and concerned motorists began to notify the police. After receiving calls about two women disrupting traffic and causing chaos in the M6, local authorities went to investigate. The particular group of police that responded had a film crew in tow who were shooting a reality television show called Motorway Cops, and with cameras in hand, they captured the bizarre events that unfolded. Expecting to arrive at a scene of multiple fatalities, police were surprised to see the two women unharmed. As officers tried to calm the twins, Ursula suddenly darted into traffic, where she was struck by a large truck. Her sister Sabina followed her, and she was hit by a speeding sedan, somersaulting over the hood and windshield before landing in the third lane of traffic. Both women suffered multiple injuries. As the Erickson sisters lay on the asphalt of the M6, severely wounded from being struck by vehicles, police and paramedics scrambled to their aid. Ursula's legs were crushed, leaving her immobilized, and Sabina was unconscious for 15 minutes. But as the emergency responders attempted to help the twins, they became resistant. Sabina began screaming, they're going to steal your organs, and telling paramedics, I recognize you, I know you're not real. Sabina suddenly displayed almost superhuman strength, rose to her feet, and punched a female patrol officer who attempted to restrain her. She then ran back into the middle of the motorway. Though it took several police officers and paramedics, Sabina was subdued shortly after. The term folia dua is used to describe a shared psychological disorder, wherein two people, typically related, experience a shared delusion. It is an extremely rare clinical disorder, and it's thought to be what may have occurred to the Erickson sisters that day on the M6. The twins were hospitalized in a mental facility following their apprehension, though doctors were unable to pinpoint the delusion or the reason Ursula and Sabine continually leapt in front of traffic. Ursula would spend three months in the psychiatric facility, while Sabina would be released back into society after a short stay, a decision that proved catastrophically short-sighted. Just days after her arrest on May 17, 2008, Sabina was released by authorities. As she wandered the streets of Stoke-on-Trent, she encountered two men walking a dog and asked where she might find a bed and breakfast. Glenn Hollingshead, a 54-year-old licensed paramedic, invited Sabina into his home for the evening. Back at Mr. Hollingshead's home, where his friend Peter Malloy was also visiting, Erickson's behavior became increasingly bizarre. She offered the men cigarettes but quickly snatched them from their mouths, claiming they were poisoned and she routinely peered out the window as though on the lookout for someone. Malloy left his friend and his guest late that evening. The next day, Sabina, in a fit of unexplained rage, stabbed Holland's head five times with a butcher knife, killing him. After murdering Glenn Holland's head, Sabina fled the scene. She had taken a hammer from her victim's home and was spotted on a road nearby, repeatedly hitting herself over the head with it. Joshua Gradage, a passing motorist, stopped in an effort to help the clearly troubled woman. Erickson hit him on the head with a piece of roof tile and fled again on foot. Paramedics soon got involved and gave chase to the fugitive Sabina, who attempted to flee by jumping off a 40-foot bridge onto the A50 motorway. Though she suffered numerous fractures, Erickson survived and was arrested and charged with murder. Sabina Erickson was charged with the murder of Glenn Hollinshead on September 11, 2008. Her trial began September 1, 2009. It was stalled due to difficulty obtaining her medical records from Sweden. Erickson pleaded guilty to manslaughter due to diminished responsibility. She never explained her actions and only responded to police questions with no comment. Sabina's defense team argued that she'd suffered from folia du or a shared psychosis with her twin sister Ursula, causing her to have intense delusions during her committal of her crimes. The judge determined that she had low culpability for her crimes due to her diminished state, and she was sentenced to five years in prison. The family of Glenn Holland said was unhappy with the outcome of Sabina Erickson's trial. 
Why, they wondered, had the woman been released from psychiatric care just two days after apparently attempting to kill herself on the M6? Ursula reportedly went back to the United States after the incident, while Sabina was released on parole in 2011. It's believed she returned to Europe. However, her whereabouts are currently unknown. As for exactly what happened that set off the bizarre chain of events for the twin Erickson sisters, that remains a mystery. When asked for a possible explanation, Detective Superintendent Dave Garrett had this to say. The reasons for the two events may never be truly known or understood, but the taking of Glenn's life was a violent and senseless act. When Weird Darkness returns, we'll look at the mysterious and violent death in 1761 of Marc Antoine Callas. We still don't know what killed him. And why do some people in Iceland still believe in elves? These stories are up next. Truck driving is a lonely profession. It is hard on both the driver and the families that love them. One of the hardest moments in the driver's life, if after being on the road for weeks, is when they return home for a couple of days only to leave again. They seem to always be saying goodbye to the ones they love. But for this driver, he must say his final goodbye. The novel of suspense and the paranormal. Saying Goodbye by Jason R. Davis. Narrated by Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. Welcome back to Weird Darkness, I'm Darren Marlar. If you or someone you know is struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction, I'd like to invite you to visit the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There I've gathered numerous resources to help you find hope and solutions. For those suffering from thoughts of suicide or self-harm, there's the Suicide in Crisis Lifeline, as well as the Crisis Text Line. Both have trained counselors at all hours to help those in need, and the page even includes text numbers for the U.S., Canada, United Kingdom, and Ireland. Those struggling with depression can get help through the Seven Cups website and app, and there's information for anybody to read more about what depression truly is and how to identify it through our friends at ifred.org. There are resources for those who battle addictions, be it drugs, alcohol, or self-destructive behavior, along with help for those who are related to addicts. The page has links to help you find a therapist or a counselor, to find help for those who have a family member with Alzheimer's or dementia, help for those in a crisis pregnancy, and more. These resources are always there when you or someone you love needs them on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash hope. In 1761, a young Frenchman died violently. This tragedy would lead to what is still one of that country's most famous cases of judicial injustice. Assuming, of course, that it truly was an injustice at all. The grim chain of events began on October 13, when the body of 28-year-old Marc Antoine Callas was found dead in his family home in Toulouse. The Callas family initially stated that he had undoubtedly died of an apoplexy. However, the doctor who examined the corpse found rope marks around his neck and bruising behind the ears, leading him to conclude Marc Antoine had died of strangulation. When confronted with this evidence, the family changed their story. His father Jean told authorities that he'd found Marc Antoine hanging from a rope balanced between two open doors in a storehouse on the family's property quite dead. 
Anxious to avoid the scandal of a family suicide, they cut the body down, hoping the untimely death could be attributed to natural causes. The young man had wished to become a Roman Catholic, a move that went against the grain of his strongly Protestant family. Mark Antoine was known to be a moody, depressed sort, a state of mind that was strongly exacerbated by his recent spiritual conflicts, not to mention a pile of gambling debts that he'd accumulated. All in all, it did not seem unlikely that he had resorted to killing himself. Most of France believed otherwise. Onlookers interpreted this evidence as pointing to murder, not suicide. France was still a strongly Catholic country, which led them to look upon the Huguenot Callas family with deep suspicion and regard the dead would-be convert as a martyr. In short, popular opinion had it that Marc Antoine's father murdered him over their religious conflicts, with his family's approbation. It was conveniently ignored that another son, Louis, had turned Catholic while still remaining in the family's good graces. Jean Callas was arrested and subjected to a trial that was clearly, unabashedly, set against him. To the surprise of no one, he was convicted and sentenced to a particularly hideous fate, which was seen as fitting for the particularly hideous crime of filicide. He was broken on the wheel and then strangled. To the end, he insisted that he was innocent. The punitive measures did not end there. The callous daughters were forced into a convent and the mother and surviving sons exiled. Marc Antoine's death destroyed the entire family. Despite the verdict, the case was still enigmatic enough to attract the attention of Voltaire. After a bit of amateur detective work, he concluded that Marc Antoine had indeed committed suicide. He learned that the young man had, on the day of his death, lost a lot of money playing cards and that he greatly feared facing his father with the news. Voltaire also pointed out that Marc Antoine had been the biggest man in his family, towering over his 62-year-old father. He found it highly unlikely that Jean Callas, even with the help of the rest of the family, could have overpowered his son sufficiently to hang him. He believed the family had been unjustly persecuted because of their unpopular religious beliefs. Voltaire used his reputation as one of Europe's greatest intellectuals, his contacts in high places, and his brilliant powers of oratory to launch a rehabilitation campaign, albeit one rather late in the day, for Jean Callas. He published A Treatise on Tolerance, pleading with his countrymen to not hate one another, let us not destroy one another in the midst of peace. His campaign worked. In March of 1764, a royal council met to study the matter. A panel of judges was appointed to rehear the case. The upshot was that a year later they ruled that there had been a terrible miscarriage of justice. Although they could do nothing for poor old Jean, his family was allowed to return from their exile, and their property was restored. Voltaire did a bit of pardonable self-congratulation by proclaiming that France had seen the finest fifth act the theater can give us. Was this a finest ending or merely a bitterly ironic twist? In 1929, an author named Marc Chazain published Les Affaires Callas, which contained the fruits of his own investigation of the case. He offered the theory that Marc Antoine's death was not due either to suicide or filicide. He suggested that the young man was attacked and strangled from someone who had followed him into his house, possibly someone from his gaming club. The murderer then slipped out of the house. Chassain noted that servants in the household had overheard a man's cries of murder not long before the body was discovered. Experiments proved to his satisfaction that it was virtually impossible for anyone to hang himself in the way described by the Callas family. Although he acknowledged the brilliance of Voltaire's defense, Chassain believed the great philosopher was motivated largely by his anti-Catholic sentiments rather than an objective desire for justice. Even in the midst of his campaign to clear Jean Callas's name, Voltaire had privately admitted that the case was a puzzling mystery. Chassain proposed that the Callas family was guilty of ineptly stage-managing the discovery of the body, although it is hard to explain why they would cover up their son's murder, especially when they wound up paying such a dear price for their silence. In the end, 
Chassain clearly left open the possibility that the family truly was responsible for the murder after all. So, how did Mark Antoine Callis die? We'll never know for sure. Coming up, as two boys were walking back to the house on their farm, a small stone rolled past them. Then a second one. They immediately thought some other boys were hiding in the scrub and throwing stones for a joke. But they could not have been more wrong. Up next, though, they're known as the Hidden Folk, the elusive and magical residents of Iceland who live inside rocks and sometimes play games with unsuspecting passers-by. Are they real? That's a complicated question if you ask Icelanders. That story is up next. There is a knock at the door late at night. You answer it to find two small children standing there. You're suddenly filled with an inexplicable fear. Let us in, they say. We need to use the phone. It's at that point the fear turns to utter dread as you see that these kids have completely black eyes. The Black Eyed Kids is an exploration of this terrifying phenomenon using true stories of encounters with black eyed kids submitted to the My Haunted Life 2 website. G. Michael Vasey examines the evidence and investigates the terrifying black eyed kids phenomenon coming to some startling and shocking conclusions. Are they demonic soul-eaters responsible for the disappearance of some of the 90,000 Americans missing at any point in time? Or is this just another urban legend, another boogeyman designed to keep you awake at night? Listen to the book and find out. The Black Eyed Kids by G. Michael Vasey, narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. Welcome back to Weird Darkness, I'm Darren Marlar. Do you have a true paranormal story that has happened to you or someone you know? You can share it by clicking on Tell Your Story at WeirdDarkness.com and I might use it in a future episode. Hulavuk, the Hidden Folk The elusive and magical residents of Iceland, who live inside rocks and sometimes play games with unsuspecting passers-by. Are they real? That's a complicated question if you ask Icelanders. Also sometimes known as Alfar, Icelandic for elves, though many believe Alfar and Huldafolk are actually two distinct groups, these mysterious people are not quick to make their presence known. But Icelandic folklore is full of strange tales of individuals crossing their paths. Sometimes these encounters end well, with good luck. Other times, not so much. In many stories, the Huldafolk will visit people in their dreams. Elves are most active during the holidays, according to legend, and during Christmas and New Year's, or Yule, they're said to venture out to find new homes. They also partake in wild parties, which could be quite dangerous to any humans who get caught in their way. Just make sure you don't throw any rocks, lest you might hit an elf by accident, or so goes an old superstition. Many polls and surveys have claimed that over half of Icelanders believe in the existence of these elves and Huldafolk. Or, more accurately, they won't deny the possibility that they exist. In 2017, one such poll by the Reykjavik grapevine showed that 67% of Icelanders believed in elves, or wouldn't outright deny their existence. A previous poll way back in 2007 claimed the number to be at least 54%. Iceland Magazine suggests, jokingly, that all these polls are skewed heavily by the hidden folk themselves. But do Icelanders really believe in them? 
It's a kind of Pascal's wager for elves in many ways. You might as well allow for the possibility that hidden folk exist. Otherwise, you might leave yourself open to all sorts of elvish mischief. On the other hand, many Icelanders believe in elves in the same way others believe in Santa Claus. It's a way of keeping their culture alive and something fun to think about. And yet, there are also those who truly believe the Alfar and Huldefolk exist. According to local folklore, the Huldefolk live in a world parallel to our own. They dress in old-fashioned clothing and are only seen when they want to be seen. They inhabit trees and boulders and venture into our world through certain areas and hills and mountains and other natural formations. Many claim to have had personal experiences with elves, or at least know someone who has. The elves' capital is said to be located in Hafnarfjörður, Iceland, where, according to National Geographic, visitors can venture out on an elf walk to learn about their history. The elf king and queen live at a cliff there called Hammerin. It's all part of Icelandic culture and folklore. The country even has its very own elf school where students learn about the Huldafolk and other mythological creatures. Anyone can sign up. The school is led by headmaster Magnus Skarfedensen, and it even has an official website. Quote, the elf school is open all year round in Reykjavik. The school is 32 years old this year. What students in the elf school gain and learn is everything that's known about elves and hidden people, as well as gnomes, dwarfs, fairies, trolls, mountain spirits, as well as other nature spirits and mythical beings in Iceland and in other countries." Unquote. In 2018, Max Mosher of the Globe and Mail visited Iceland's elf school and shared his experience. Classes typically last a few hours and primarily focus on the retelling of tales involving Huldafolk encounters and folklore. They also apparently end with buttered bread and pancakes with whipped cream. Sign me up! Magnus Skarfedensen is also notably the leader of the Paranormal Foundation of Iceland. One of the major elf-related headlines over the past several years was the incident involving a boulder that had to be moved before the construction of a new road through the Galgaran lava field. The large stone was thought by some to be an elf church. Peter Mathiasen, head of communication with the Icelandic Road Administration, told BBC Ideas that they agreed to move the rock not necessarily because they truly believe elves congregate there, but because they see it as part of their cultural inheritance. Protecting these stones and other areas said to be claimed by elves is perhaps a way of preserving Iceland's culture and natural wonder. In that case, I suppose it doesn't hurt to believe in elves. Iceland is a pretty amazing place after all. The haunting fascination of a spook or spirit story drives my imagination into realms of wildest fantasies. But I could not resist the invitation to listen to an uncanny mystery which happened years ago in the Mali wilderness along the River Murray. The descriptions of the weird workings of recent Gawler spirits were jingling in my brain as I sat before Mr. Henry Hayward on Tuesday. The old man, he was 78 last January, came into the register office to tell me a tale of the Mali, and I expected to hear how a ghostly monster had terrified the people in the Lonely Scrub. But when he began, I knew he meant to deal in spirits and not in ghosts. Mr. Hayward now lives in retirement at William Street, Norwood. It must be 14 years ago now, he continued since I had a nice little block in the Mallee Scrub. My nearest neighbor was Mr. Fred Towell, who now lives in Kent Town. One night, my eldest son Edward, who was then about 23 years old, and my youngest son Tom, about 12 years of age, went out to feed the horses. It was a clear, moonlight night. As they were walking back to the house from the stables, something rolled past them. At first, the boys took no notice, but when a second something came by, they stopped to see what it was. 
they found a small stone. They came back to the house thinking that the other boys were hiding in the scrub and throwing stones for a joke. But when they found their brothers in bed, they told me about the affair. Of course, I said someone had been playing at Lark. Next night, I went up to the stables alone. I got into the yard and was looking into the manger when a stone as big as an egg fell right against my legs. There were mallee bushes close by, and I jumped over the rails and sent a few stones into the clump. I thought that someone was behind it throwing stones at me, but there was no one about. I then began to wonder what it all could mean. Next day, my wife and daughter were washing outside of the house when a large stone came over the building and fell close to them. Another missile followed a couple of seconds later. They could see no one near the place and were sure the stones had come from the other side of the house. Well, everybody in the district heard of the strange happenings at my place, and sometimes parties of 20 people came and watched the pebbles falling, and they all went away mystified. At one time, a large piece of earth fell near my house, and one of the boys saw a piece of wood come from goodness knows where. On the third night, I went over to a neighbor named Hutchinson and asked him to come with me to the horse yard. We were standing near the manger while the boys were pulling hay from a stack when a large piece of wood came hurtling down and grazed the brim of Hutchinson's hat and fell at his feet. I looked over the stable shed, but again, there was no one in sight, nor could I hear anything. If anyone had been moving about in the scrub, which was thick near my house, I could easily have heard them, because the night was still. As we went down to the house, stones kept descending around us, and others rolled past our feet. I'll never forget poor old Duncan O'Dea and the scare he got the night he came to see the stones, went on Mr. Hayward, and chuckled to himself as he recalled the incident. Duncan O'Dea came with about 13 or 14 others one bright moonlit night. I took them to the horse yard, and as we were leaning against the rails, a big stone fell between Duncan's feet. He swore that he saw it rise out of the ground. He stooped and felt to see whether it was warm, but it was quite cool. Just after this, two young chaps from Adelaide visited my place in great style to explain the mystery. They were staying in the district, and on hearing of the occurrence at my farm, they put on airs and told everyone that they would soon tell what caused the trouble. So they came one night, the stones pelted down around them, and they went away as wise as they came about the cause of the trouble, as they called it. Bill Roth, who is now in Western Australia, proceeded Mr. Hayward, was a neighbor of mine at this time. He did not believe in ghosts of any kind, and when he heard of my experience, he laughed and said, all rot. Anyhow, Bill was not afraid to come and have a look at what was going on. He had not been on the farm ten minutes before he saw what he had heard so much about, A short distance from the house was a pine tree, and on this night the stones seemed to be striking the tree. Bill listened for a while, then a stone struck the ground near to where he was standing. He looked at me and said, "'Don't you think we'd better get out of this?' I could see that Bill's idea of ghosts had changed. As we walked away from the yard, he turned to me and said, "'I have never believed in ghosts. I've often heard old men tell stories about them, but I thought it was all rot.' but I'm satisfied now. The stones had been fallen night and day for almost a fortnight. At last, people were afraid to come near my farm. I, too, was beginning to fear that someone might be seriously injured by the missiles. On several nights, the boys had gone out with guns and blazed away in the direction from which the stones seemed to come, but they still arrived. I was sure the trouble was not the work of a human being, but still, things were getting unsafe. I said to my wife one day, I'll go into Manham and tell the police trooper, his name was Gibbons, if I remember all right, and ask him to come out. We decided that we would not tell even the children that we were going to bring the police out. I wrote to Gibbons, and on the very day the letter was sent, the stoning stopped. It happened that the police officer was absent from home for several days after the letter arrived, and he did not get it until he returned. He did not come out but I saw him some time later and told him all that had happened and how the thing had ended so soon as the letter was written. Another strange thing about the affair was that 
During the whole of the time the stones were falling, no one was hit by any of them. When Weird Darkness returns, Bella Gunnis lured numerous suitors to her Indiana farm. Not to entertain them or be courted by them, she simply wanted to kill them in cold blood and dump their bodies in her hog pen. Sometimes you feel a bit nutty, especially if you're a weirdo. If that feeling transfers to your taste buds as well, I've got some great news for you. Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy Coffee. Wrap your taste buds around this medium dark roast blend with shrouds of almond, honey, and chocolate. Each bag of Nutty Mummy is exclusive to Weird Darkness and is roasted to order, then bandaged, I mean bagged, specifically for you to ensure maximum freshness for you, your mummy, and anyone else you share it with. Entomb your old coffee and bring your taste buds back from the dead with Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Welcome back to Weird Darkness. I'm Darren Marlar. If you'd like to display your dark weirdness wherever you go, you can find Weird Darkness t-shirts, trucker caps, dad hats, school supplies, kids' clothes, coffee mugs, and more in the Weird Darkness store, with dozens of designs to choose from and a variety of colors to match your style. Grab some weirdo merchandise for yourself, or maybe as a gift for the weirdo in your life, by clicking on Store at WeirdDarkness.com. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash store. In 1908, in LaPorte, Indiana, authorities were busy digging up a hog pen. But it wasn't hogs they were looking for. It was bodies. And they found more than a dozen. All signs pointed to Belle Gunnis as the killer behind the mass grave. She was a Norwegian immigrant and nowhere to be found. Belle was an exception to the serial killer model. While the vast majority are men, she was a woman. Moreover, her motives were different. While most serial killers are driven by pure sadistic pleasure, Belle was mainly motivated by insatiable greed. Born in Selva, Norway in 1859, much of Belle's early life remains a mystery. She was raised in poverty and worked tirelessly for a profitable farm for three years in order to fund her trip to the United States. In 1881, she crossed the ocean changed her name and settled in the Midwest, abandoning her old life forever. Bell married a man named Mads Ditley Anton Sorensen in 1884, and the couple soon opened a candy shop in Chicago. The store never amounted to much, and within a year it mysteriously burned down. The couple collected the insurance money which they used to buy a new home. According to a census, the couple had four children. Two of the children allegedly died of acute colitis, a malady with symptoms that closely resemble poisoning. Then, Mads died on July 30, 1900, the only day on which both of his life insurance policies overlapped. His cause of death was ruled a heart failure, and Bell claimed that she had given him medicinal powders to ease his suffering. She also, of course, collected the insurance money on his life. Mad's family was suspicious of murder, but Belle fled. She bought a farm just outside Laporte, Indiana, and rediscovered an old friend named Peter Gunnis, also a widower. The two married in 1902. Soon thereafter, Peter's infant daughter died while under Belle's care. Months later, Peter also died of strange circumstances. Belle claimed that he was scalded with brine while reaching over the stove. Once more, Bell's pockets brimmed with insurance money. 
but her lucrative personal tragedies were getting suspicious. So she placed personal ads in major Midwestern newspapers stating that she was a comely widow. Triflers, she said, need not apply. Men arrived. There was John Doe from Minnesota who came with money to pay off Bell's mortgage and disappeared a week later. There was George Anderson from Missouri who also brought money for the mortgage, but woke to find Bell's sinister face staring down at him in the dark. He fled as fast as he could and never looked back. Bell's house became her citadel. She kept the windows shut and her blinds drawn. She spent nights shoveling in the hog pen and often placed large orders for trunks to be delivered to her home. Gentlemen suitors never ceased to show up, and all were never seen again. Bell's final victim was Andrew Helgelian from South Dakota. After many letter exchanges, Andrew finally decided to take the leap and meet Bell in person. The words that persuaded him? My heart beats in wild rapture for you, my Andrew. I love you. Come prepared to stay forever. Andrew arrived on the farm, like the lonely hearts before him, and, like those doomed suitors, he too vanished without a trace. Throughout it all stood one man, Ray Lamphere, Bell's farmhand. He did anything Bell asked of him and seethed with jealousy whenever a new suitor arrived at Bell's door. Eventually, Bell realized Ray's instability was a risk to her livelihood. When she fired him in 1908, the man went mad. Algelian's brother, meanwhile, had grown suspicious of his missing brother Andrew. Bell tried to shake him off with vague stories about Andrew's disappearance, but it was clear her excuses weren't cutting it. With the walls closing in on her, she drafted up a new will and left her entire estate to her children. Then, on the morning of April 28, 1908, Bell's home burst into flames. Her newly hired farmhand, Joe Maxson, awoke to thick smoke filling his room. He leapt out of his second-floor window, dying from the fall. Bell's children, unable to escape, were found dead among the ruins once the smoke cleared. Bell, however, was nowhere to be found. Bell had previously reported Ray to the police as a threat to her family. When news of the fire broke, authorities arrested him and charged him with murder and arson. But one mystery remained the charred remains of a headless woman uncovered in the rubble. Bell's large stature, she stood six feet tall and weighed 200 pounds, didn't seem to match up with the diminutive corpse. Yet, a set of real teeth had been found in the debris. Bell's dentist claimed they contained gold plating work that he had performed on her. No one knew what to believe. Lamphere was found guilty of arson but was struck ill soon after his conviction. Shortly before passing, he confessed everything to a priest. He said he'd been an accomplice to many of Bell's murders. He revealed that Bell typically drugged the coffee of her victims before caving in their heads with a meat chopper and dismembering the bodies in the basement. The remains were then dumped into the hog pen. Lamphere claimed that on the day of the fire, Bell beheaded her new maid, dressed the body in her own clothes, set her home ablaze, and never looked back. Bell, Ray said, was still alive. She was still out there, somewhere. It's believed that Bell Gunnis murdered between 25 and 40 people, though only 12 could be verified from excavations in the hog pen. Prior to the fire, Bell had withdrawn all of her money from the bank. In 1931, a woman named Esther Carlson was arrested in Los Angeles after poisoning a Norwegian-American man for her money. Some people who knew Bell claimed that they recognized Esther as her, but she died while waiting to go to trial. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please tell somebody about it who loves the paranormal or strange stories true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do, and tell them where they can listen to the show so they can tune in next weekend. 
If you missed any part of tonight's show, or if you'd like to hear it again, you can subscribe to the podcast in your favorite podcast app by searching for Weird Darkness. By doing that, you'll get a copy of tonight's show. You'll also get tonight's Sudden Death Overtime content, where we find out if people ever were really tortured with Iron Maidens, plus daily podcast episodes that come out seven days per week. Visit WeirdDarkness.com and you can follow me on social media, drop me an email, send me your own true paranormal story, listen to other podcasts that I host, and more. All stories used tonight are purported to be true, unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the stories or the authors in the show notes, which I've already posted at WeirdDarkness.com. The disturbing case of the Erickson twins is by Harrison Tempest for Graveyard Shift. The mysterious death of Mark Antoine Callis is from Strange Company. The Elves of Iceland was written by Rob Schwartz for Stranger Dimensions. Stone Throwing Spirits is from The Fordian. Bella Gunnis, the Black Widow of the Midwest, is by Stephen Casal for The Lineup. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Isaiah 12, verses 1 and 2. I will praise you, O Lord. Although you were angry with me, your anger has turned away and you have comforted me. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. And a final thought. God's plan is always more beautiful than our desire. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. Are you a member of the Darkness Syndicate? The Darkness Syndicate is a private membership where you receive commercial-free episodes of the Weird Darkness podcast and radio show, behind-the-scenes video updates about future projects and events I'm working on. You can share your own opinions on ideas to help me decide upon Weird Darkness contests and events. You can hear audiobooks I'm narrating before even the publishers or authors get to hear them. You also receive bonus audio of other projects I'm working on outside of Weird Darkness. You get all of these benefits and more starting at only $5 per month. Join the Weird Darkness Syndicate at WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. In May 1951, one year into the Korean War, PFC Francis P. Wall and his regiment found themselves stationed near Chorwon, about 60 miles north of Seoul. As they were preparing to bombard a nearby village with artillery, all of a sudden the soldiers saw a strange sight up in the hills, like a jack-o'-lantern come wafting down across the mountain. What happened after, the pulsing, attacking light the lingering, debilitating symptoms would mystify many for decades to come. As the GIs watched, the craft made its way down into the village, where the artillery airbursts were starting to explode. We further noticed that this object would get right into the center of an airburst of artillery and yet remain unharmed, while later told John P. Timmerman of the Center for UFO Studies in a 1987 interview. Suddenly, the object turned, Wall said, and whereas at first it had glowed orange, now it was a pulsating blue-green brilliant light. He asked his company commander for permission to fire at the object with armor-piercing bullets from an M1 rifle. As the bullets hit the body of the craft, he recalled, they made a metallic ding. The object started behaving still more erratically, shunting from side to side as its lights flashed on and off. Wall's recollections of what happened next are stranger still. We were attacked, he said, swept by some form of a ray that was emitted in pulses, in waves you could visually see only when it was aiming directly at you. That is to say, like a searchlight sweeps around and the segments of light, you would see it coming at you. He remembered a burning, tingling sensation sweeping over his body, as if he were being penetrated. The men rushed into underground bunkers and peeped through the windows watching as the craft hovered above them and then shot off at a 45-degree angle. 
It's that quick, he said. It was there and was gone. Welcome, weirdos. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness Radio, where every week you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this hour… In 1882, the brutal killing of several members of the Joyce family in rural Galway caused outrage in Irish society and remains one of the most notorious homicides in Irish history. However, a few years later, Cork was rocked by an equally heinous case which has largely been forgotten. We'll look at the brutal murders of four family members that took place in Castletown Roche, Ireland. An Arizona family encounters a creature from the dark side of Navajo legend. John Blair liked to keep things in the family. But in his case, it wasn't just a saying. It was literal, because John was infamous for being bigamous. But first, dozens of Korean war GIs claimed an unidentified flying object made them all sick. Theories range from high-tech Soviet death rays to extraterrestrials studying how we engage in battle to combat stress-induced hallucinations. What actually happened? We begin with that story. If you're new here, welcome to the show. And if you're already a member of this Weirdo family, please take a moment and invite someone else to listen in with you. Recommending Weird Darkness to others helps make it possible for me to keep doing the show. And while you're listening, be sure to visit WeirdDarkness.com where you can follow me on social media, listen to free audiobooks that I've narrated, and more. That's WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. Three days after the incident, the entire company of men was evacuated by ambulance, with special roads cut to haul out those too weak to walk. When they finally received medical treatment, they were found to have dysentery and an extremely high white blood cell count. To me, says Richard F. Haynes, a UFO researcher and former NASA scientist, they had symptoms that sounded like the effects of radiation. In the wake of the Korean War, which ended in July 1953, dozens of men have reported seeing similar unidentified flying objects over the course of the 37-month conflict. The craft often resembled flying saucers. According to unofficial reports, as many as 42 were corroborated by additional witness reports, an average of more than one a month in just over three years. At first, according to Korean War historian Paul M. Edwards, many researchers believed that the sightings were Soviet experiments, based on German technology and foreign research in anti-gravity. These were supposedly so large they could carry 50 tons of weight and were powered by electromagnetic propulsion, he writes in unusual footnotes to the Korean War. What was being sighted, it was suggested, were disks the Russians were testing over the Korean skies. But in the years since the fall of the Soviet Union, a number of Soviet reports of sighting UFOs over Korea have trickled in, discrediting these theories. Why were there so many UFO sightings throughout the Korean War? Were they the product of thousands of exhausted men under incredible stress? Or a sign of something more mysterious? From 1947 until 1969, the United States Air Force ran Project Blue Book, a systematic study into unidentified flying objects and their potential threat to national security. When it was shuttered in December 1969, the Air Force announced they had found nothing of note and terminated all activity under the auspices of the study but many believe that the project ended abortively and that there was more work to be done, leading to similar interviews with witnesses and other investigators being done by dozens of volunteers for decades after the project ended. Haynes is one of them. He describes himself as a scientist with an open mind, rather than someone with something to prove. I don't believe in them, I don't not believe in them, he says. I'm trying to let the data convince me one way or the other, which is the scientific approach. 
But, he says, it's striking how many accounts there are of similar sightings in the Korean War and other conflicts. In the early years of the Cold War, it was often theorized that these crafts might be Soviet or Chinese vessels with technology unknown to American troops. Haynes believes this theory has been conclusively disproved. If they were, he says, they would have been building those crafts for use in later wars, like the Vietnam War, for instance. The Soviet UFO sightings Edwards describes makes it similarly unlikely, as do the impossibly high-tech specifications of some of the sightings. In Wall's case, for instance, he described a kind of force field taking effect a while after he began shooting, where his bullets simply ricocheted away from the craft. Haynes, for his part, believes the rash of sightings across the Korean War might suggest that something in the universe is especially interested in how human beings behave in the throng of military action. We tend to be very creative to fight a war, Haynes says, listing off the various sciences and technologies that might come into play in military action. If you were interested in how another country or another race of people fought their wars, you'd want to collect information on that, wouldn't you? He trails off. That's one possible explanation. There may be others. But the vast majority of UFO sightings, as much as 80%, are later found to be totally ordinary phenomena, like clouds or human crafts, rather than anything otherworldly. In Wall's case, precisely what he saw that day has never been conclusively proven or disproven. Without the testimony of other men in Wall's regiment, it's hard to ascertain whether they too had the same strange experience, even if it can be corroborated that many did get very ill. In the years following the war, Wall lost contact with many of the men in his regiment. After the experience, he remembered his company agreeing that they would not file a report, because they'd lock every one of us up and think we were crazy, he told Timmerman. What made him choose to make a testimony, however, was the lasting after-effects of his illness, including permanent weight loss from 180 pounds to 138, stomach problems and periods of disorientation and memory loss after returning to the United States. He retired in 1969 at the age of just 42, his daughter Renee Denny says, and spent 30 years out of work, struggling with the aftereffects of the war. Back then, they didn't know the name of it, but I guess you could say it was a form of PTSD, she says. Over the years, he would tell and retell the tale of his strange UFO sighting. The story was always the same, says Denny. It never changed through the years. But there was other fallout. He was especially affected by the sounds of airplanes and once knocked his mother and sister to the ground after mistaking them for enemy troops. I guess he would have flashbacks, his daughter says. Wall's recollections of the UFO sighting were consistent and acute. But whether what he remembered actually happened is harder to prove. Fighting conditions were almost intolerably stressful, and it's entirely possible that he may have experienced some kind of hallucination brought on by the terror of the situation where he regularly feared for his life. It might also have been a moment of feverish delirium. Even the raised white blood cell count that surprised army doctors and Haynes is consistent with many of the bacterial infections which might also cause severe dysentery, as are hallucinations. In a later interview with Haynes, Wall described how he had discussed what he saw with some 25 other men, but none ever came forward or could later be traced. In 2002, British researchers demonstrated a link between UFO sightings and Cold War hysteria and pointed out how the number of sightings had nosedived as radar improved. That cannot be a coincidence, David Clark told The Guardian. Those early confirmations were just a product of a primitive radar system. The flurry of UFO sightings, Haynes describes, may have been the dual effect of these two threats, a potentially world-destroying war on the horizon and the incredible pressure of being in the military. Wall had experiences in those years in Korea that would scar him until his death in 1999. One night, Denny says, he managed to make his way through a pitch-dark minefield, praying for his life as he went. Others who made the same journey were not so fortunate. When he went into the war, she says, he was happy-go-lucky, just a totally different person to when he came out. Whether the UFO sightings that Wall and so many other men reported were a product of this personality-altering trauma or the effects of something requiring much greater investigation remains a mystery. When Weird Darkness returns, we'll look at the brutal but mostly forgotten murders 
of four family members that took place in Castletown, Roche, Ireland. And an Arizona family encounters a creature from the dark side of a Navajo legend. Might it have been a skinwalker? These stories and more, up next. Remember staying up late at night while growing up, watching your local TV station's horror host presenting a terrible B-horror movie or so-bad-it's-good sci-fi flick from the 1950s? That's what the Monster Channel at WeirdDarkness.tv has to offer – all day, every day. You can visit WeirdDarkness.tv and immediately be entertained by a horror host and horrible movie. You can even invite your friends to watch with you and use the chat feature to talk about what you're watching. And our monthly Weirdo Watch Party takes place there as well. Get your frights and funnies 24-7, 365 at WeirdDarkness.tv. In 1882, the Mamtrasna murders, the brutal killing of several members of the Joyce family in rural Galway, caused outrage in Irish society and remains one of the most notorious homicides in Irish history. However, a few years later, Cork was rocked by an equally heinous case, which has largely been forgotten. The deaths of four members of the Sheehan family outside Castletown Roche in a dispute over land revealed was at times a dangerous obsession with land in Irish society, but also a community willing to turn a blind eye to extreme violence. On January 20, 1886, William Sheehan was taken from his cell in Cork Jail. He was brought the short distance to the prison chapel for a brief mass before dawn. Then he began what was his final journey to the execution chamber in the prison where he was hanged at 8 a.m. William Sheehan suffered a lonely death this was unsurprising. He was among the most reviled men in Ireland at the time. One journalist commented that if there was an argument in favor of the death sentence, it was in the case of this cold-blooded triple murderer. Sheehan's downfall began when he was evicted from his farm during the Land War, after which he had been forced to emigrate. He had relocated to New Zealand, where he and his wife Mary Ann started a new life. However, within a few months, a gruesome discovery back in Ireland had changed everything. Less than a year after Sheehan had emigrated, his former neighbors were cleaning out an old disused well. Over 70 feet beneath the surface, they discovered the decaying remains of William Sheehan's mother, Catherine, his sister Hannah, and his brother Thomas. Arrests were made in the local area, however, the RIC quickly identified William himself as the main suspect. Somewhat remarkably, he was tracked down in New Zealand and William Sheehan was brought back to stand trial for the murder of his mother, sister, and brother in Cork. While he protested his innocence throughout his trial, he admitted to the crime after he was found guilty. In his admission, he claimed that he had murdered his family members because his mother would not allow him to marry a woman of his choosing. The case was not simply an ill-fated romance that had gone terribly wrong. It revealed the dark underbelly of a society that was obsessed with land and property. William Sheehan was born into a relatively well-off farming family at Carringdownan, outside Castletown Roche on the eve of the Great Famine. Along with a farm of over 20 acres of fertile land at the edge of the Golden Vale, the Sheehans also owned a pub in the nearby village of Rock Mills. This shielded the family from the worst deprivation of the Great Hunger. Indeed, while the famine devastated Irish society, the Sheehans were among those in a position to take advantage as the economy recovered in the following decades. Despite the death of his father, the family farm tripled in size by the 1870s. When William's mother decided to settle the matter of inheritance in 1877, this inevitably led to growing tensions. With several children, the arrangements were complex. William, as the oldest son living at home, was set to inherit the farm. In what was a common custom, his mother Catherine, along with his siblings Thomas and Hannah, both in their twenties, planned to leave the family home in order to allow William to start his own family. Therefore, given Catherine, Thomas, and Hannah faced an uncertain economic future, William had to compensate them. To finalize this complex arrangement, William himself would marry, 
and his wife's dowry would be used to pay off his family members. Marriage in this situation was little more than an economic transaction between the respective families. Where love for the land ended and affections for a future wife began was impossible to determine. Attraction and love was very much a secondary issue. It was the size of his future wife's dowry that mattered most. William Sheehan began courting Mary Ann Brown, a woman he appeared to have genuine feelings for. But crucially, her family were also wealthy local farmers. Negotiations over the marriage began with William's mother Catherine insisting on a dowry of 300 pounds. However, Mary Ann's father James was unwilling to pay more than 170 pounds, and with neither willing to compromise, the negotiations collapsed. The entire marriage was canceled. This not only jeopardized William's relationship but cast his entire future in doubt. If his mother insisted on a dowry of 300 pounds, he might struggle to find anyone willing to marry him and he would be unable to inherit. From his mother's perspective, she could not concede to her son's demand that she lower her price. With two other children and her own future to consider, a small dowry would leave her impoverished. It was in this increasingly tense situation William set his mind on his deadly course of action. Before midday on October 22, 1877, he committed the cold-blooded premeditated triple murder. He attacked his brother Thomas in the farmyard before going into the house where he killed his mother Catherine and sister Hannah. Later that night, the bodies were dumped into the disused well and covered in lime where they would remain until they were rediscovered in 1884. William claimed his family had moved away and less than a month later, he married Mary Ann Brown. His happiness did not last, however. In the following years, Ireland was hit by a deep recession. The Sheehans fell into deep debts and were evicted by their landlord in 1882. In the following year, he and his wife Mary Ann emigrated to New Zealand. However, within months of their departure, their neighbors discovered the remains of his family members in the well. This led to a sensational trial in December in Cork in 1885, where he was found guilty and sentenced to death. Sheehan was executed in Cork Prison on January 20, 1886. However, the entire case left many asking questions of the wider community of Carrigdowning. After the murders, William Sheehan had been pressed about what had happened to his family. His answers were unconvincing and suspicious, yet in the small, tight-knit community of Carrigdowning, the friends and neighbors of Catherine, Thomas, and Hannah Sheehan ignored the evidence that suggested something nefarious had taken place. Furthermore, John Sheehan, whose mother and siblings had vanished, reacted in a very odd manner. When pushed on the matter, William claimed they had moved to Nina to open a pub there. Remarkably, John never traveled to the North Tipperary town to investigate this further. He had reasons to turn a blind eye. John Sheehan also benefited from his brother's crime. After the death of his mother, he was able to transfer the family pub in Rock Mills into his name, while he also received a share of Mary Ann Brown's dowry. The Castletown Roche murders have been almost entirely forgotten, eclipsed by events like the Mamtrasna and Phoenix murders. No less sensational, the events in Cork, however, struck a nerve deep in Irish society, reflecting similar tensions that existed in many families. Some kids would risk almost anything to be thin, popular, and stop others from teasing them. But would you join the Midnight Diet Club? Esme is a slightly overweight teenage girl who's hounded endlessly by three sinister bullies. In her quest to find acceptance, she almost loses her soul in this funny, slightly scary twist on Vampire Legends. The Midnight Diet Club by Mark Newhouse, narrated by Darren Marlar. Here are a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. I'm Darren Marlar. Welcome back to Weird Darkness. In Navajo legend, 
A skinwalker is a medicine man who has gone to the dark side and is able to shapeshift into animals and other people. By night, they transform and inflict pain and suffering. Did an Arizona family encounter a real skinwalker on an eerie, deserted highway through Navajo country? All of her life, Frances T., as we will call her, has seen things, heard things, and felt them. Born into a family of sensitives, this was rather normal. In my family, you were considered odd if you didn't experience abnormal things, Frances says. We never talked much about our experiences or our feelings about them. We just accepted them as normal, which in fact to us they are. But nothing could have prepared her family for what they encountered on a dark, desolate road in Arizona 20 years ago. It's a mysterious and traumatizing event that haunts them to this day. Francis's family had moved from Wyoming to Flagstaff, Arizona in 1978, shortly after her high school graduation. Sometime between 1982 and 1983, 20-year-old Frances, her father, mother, and her younger brother took a road trip back to Wyoming in the family pickup truck. The trip was a vacation to visit with friends in and around their old hometown. The only member of the family not present was her older brother who was in the Army and stationed at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. The course along Route 163 took them through the Navajo Indian Reservation and through the town of Kayenta, just south of the Utah border, and the magnificent Monument Valley Navajo Tribal Park. Anyone who has lived in Arizona for any length of time knows that the Indian Reservation can be a beautiful if harsh place for non-natives. Many strange things happen out there, Francis says. Even my friend, a Navajo, warned us of traveling through the reservation, especially at night. Along with the warning, however, Francis's Native American friend blessed the family, and they were on their way. The trip to Wyoming was uneventful, but the trip back to Arizona along the same route more than justified the warning from Francis's friend. It still gives me goosebumps, she says. To this day, I have major anxiety attacks when I have to travel through the North Country at night. I avoid it at all costs. It was a warm summer night about 10 p.m. When the family's pickup was heading south on 163, about 20 to 30 miles from the town of Cayenta. It was a moonless night on this lonely stretch of road, so pitch black that they could only see just a few feet beyond the headlights, so dark that closing their eyes actually brought relief from the fathomless black. They'd been driving for hours with Francis's father at the wheel, and the vehicle's passengers had long ago settled into quiet. Francis and her father sandwiched her mother in the truck's cab while her brother enjoyed the night air in the back of the pickup. Suddenly, Francis' father broke the silence. We have company, he said. Frances and her mother turned around and looked out the back slider window. Sure enough, a pair of headlights appeared over the crest of a hill, then disappeared as the car went down, then reappeared. Frances commented to her father that it was nice to have company on this stretch of road. If something went wrong, neither vehicle and his passengers would be alone. Thunder began to rumble from the vast, clouded sky. The parents decided that their son should come into the cab before he got soaking wet from any rain that might fall. Frances opened the slider window and her little brother crawled in, squeezing between her and her mother. Frances turned to close the window and again noticed the headlights from the following car. They're still behind us, her father said. They must be going to either Flagstaff or Phoenix. We'll probably meet them in Cayenta when we stop to fuel up. Frances watched as the car's headlights crested another hill and began its descent until it disappeared. She watched for them to reappear. And watched. They didn't reappear. She told her father that the car should have crested the other hill again, but hadn't. Maybe they slowed down, he suggested, or pulled over. That was possible, but it just didn't make sense to Francis. Why in the hell would a driver slow down, or worse yet, stop, at the bottom of a hill in the middle of night with nothing around for miles and miles? Francis asked her father. You'd think they'd want to keep sight of the car in front of them in case anything happened. People do weird stuff when they're driving, her father replied. So, Francis kept watching, turning around every few minutes to check for those headlights, but they never did reappear. When she turned to look one last time, she noticed that the pickup was slowing down. Turning back to look out the windshield, she saw that they were rounding a sharp bend in the road, and her father had slowed the truck to about 55 miles per hour. And from that moment, time itself seemed to slow down for Francis. The atmosphere changed somehow, 
taking on an otherworldly quality. Frances turned her head to look out the passenger window when her mother screamed and her father cried out, "'What the hell is that?' Frances didn't know what was happening, but one hand instinctively reached over and held down the button for the door lock, and the other tightly grabbed the door handle. She braced her back against her small brother and held firmly onto the door, still not knowing quite why. Her brother was now yelling, "'What is it? What is it?' Her father immediately flipped on the interior cab light, and Francis could see that he was petrified. "'I have never, ever seen my father that scared in my whole life,' Francis says. Not when he came home from his tours in Vietnam, not when he came home from special assignments, not even when someone tried to firebomb our house." Francis's father was as white as a ghost. She could see the hair on the back of his neck standing straight out like a cat's, and so was the hair on his arms. She could even see the goosebumps on his skin. Panic was filling the small cab. Francis' mother was so frightened that she began shouting in her native Japanese in a high, squeaky voice as she frantically wrung her hands. The little boy just kept saying, oh my god. As the pickup sped around the bend in the road, Francis could see that the shoulder dropped off deeply into a ditch. Her father slammed on the brakes to prevent the truck from swerving into the ditch. As the pickup was slowing to a stop, something leaped out of the ditch at the side of the truck, and now Francis could clearly see what had started the panic. It was black and hairy and was eye-level with the passengers in the cab. If this was a man, it was like no man Francis had ever seen. Yet despite its monstrous appearance, whatever this thing was, it wore a man's clothes. It had on a white and blue checkered shirt and long pants, I think jeans, Francis testifies. Its arms were raised over its head, almost touching the top of the cab. This creature remained there for a few seconds, looking into the pickup, and then the pickup was past it. Francis could not believe what she had seen. It looked like a hairy man or a hairy animal in man's clothing, she says, but it didn't look like an ape or anything like that. Its eyes were yellow and its mouth was open. Although time seemed frozen and distorted in this moment of fantastic horror, it was all over within a few minutes. The headlights, her little brother coming into the cab, and the thing. By the time the family reached Kayenta for gas, they had finally calmed down. Frances and her father climbed out of the pickup and checked the side of the truck to see if the creature had done any damage. They were surprised to see that the dust on the side of the truck was undisturbed, and so was the dust on the hood and roof of the truck. In fact, they found nothing out of the ordinary. No blood, no hair, nothing. The family stretched their legs and rested at Kayenta for about 20 minutes. The car that had been following them never did show up. It's as if the car simply vanished. They drove home to Flagstaff with the cab light on and the doors securely locked. I wish I could say this was the end of the story, Francis says, but it's not. A few nights later, around 11 p.m., Francis and her brother were awakened by the sounds of drumming. They looked down his bedroom window into the backyard, which was surrounded by a fence. At first, they saw nothing but the forest beyond the fence. Then the drumming grew louder, and three or four men appeared behind the wooden fence. It looked like they were trying to climb the fence but couldn't quite manage to bring their legs up high enough and swing over, Francis says. Unable to get into the yard, the men began to chant. Francis was so scared she slept with her little brother that night. Some time later, Francis sought out her Navajo friend, hoping she could offer some explanation for these strange incidents. She told Francis that it was a skinwalker that had tried to attack her family. Skinwalkers are creatures of Navajo legend witches that can shapeshift into animals. That a skinwalker attacked them was quite unusual, Francis's friend told her, as it had been a long time since she had heard of any activity about skinwalkers, and that they normally don't bother non-natives. Francis took her friend back by the fence where she had seen the strange men trying to climb in. The Navajo woman considered the scene for a moment, then revealed that three or four skinwalkers had visited the house. She said they wanted the family but could not gain access because something was protecting the family. Francis was astonished. Why? she asked. Why would the skinwalkers want her family? Your family has a lot of power, the Navajo woman said, and they wanted it. Again, she said that skinwalkers usually don't bother non-natives, but she believed that they wanted the family enough to expose themselves. Later that day, she blessed the perimeter of the property, the house, the vehicles, and the family.
We haven't been bothered by skinwalkers since then, Francis says. Then again, I haven't been back to Cayenta. I've gone through other towns on the reservation, yes, at night, but I'm not alone. I carry a weapon, and I carry protective ambulance. Up next, John Blair. Not only was he infamous, he was also bigamous. When Weird Darkness Returns. The political season is upon us, and those flying the red colors have their promises. The politicians wearing blue have different promises. But those of us in the cryptid party have only one promise – to stay hidden and mind our own business. Don't let the political pundits, the candidates, the PACs, or your close-minded brainwashed family and friends tell you who to vote for. You're smarter than that. That's why I'm telling you who to vote for. This November, pull the lever for Bigfoot and Mothman. Our new president, Bigfoot, won't make the same mistakes as humans have. Because he's not human, Bigfoot loves our country and you. So much so that he knows you have a better idea of how to run your life than he does. So he's staying out of your life. With Vice President Mothman, their new administration will do what no administration has done in the past. Absolutely nothing. Show your support for the Cryptid Party by grabbing your Bigfoot Mothman 2024 merchandise with campaign buttons and stickers, hats, shirts, tote bags, mugs, hoodies, giant tapestries, pillows, magnets, even clothes for your kids to get them into the spirit of the political season. This year, vote for someone you can trust in, believe in, even without scientific proof of their existence. A vote for Bigfoot and Mothman is a vote you can be proud to tell others about. Get your Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 merchandise now at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. Available in all sizes and colors, even red and blue if you want to confuse people about your party loyalties. The new Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 political campaign merchandise at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. Sometime in 1850, a 19-year-old medic called John Blair Wills fell in love at first sight with a beautiful girl he spotted on a London omnibus. Following the girl home, he asked her mother, who was very surprised, for her daughter's hand in marriage. He explained that he had good prospects and was of respectable stock. His late father had been a dissenting minister in Basingstoke, and his mother, a lady of property, lived in Clapham with his brothers and sisters. Mrs. Catherine Sarah Maxwell, usually known as Kate, refused his request. The reason she gave was that a marriage would not be possible, as her daughter was merely 12 years of age. Nursing his disappointment, John returned to Clapham. In the years that followed, John decided to switch from medicine to architecture, which, as it happened, was the chosen profession of his older brother James. Then, one day in 1855, while taking his leisure in the Surrey Gardens, Quite by chance, he saw the lovely girl again. The charming Miss Mary Ann Maxwell, who was now not only more beautiful but also of marriageable age, agreed to wed John Blair Wills as long as her mother gave her permission. Mary Ann Maxwell, who was sometimes known as Marion, was born in Ilford in Essex and baptized on the 8th of March, 1838. Her father, William Stephen Maxwell, was a farmer. He appears to have died by 1851 leaving Kate with three children, namely Mary Ann, William, and Charles. Kate is later described by contemporary newspapers as living in Bath as housekeeper to a rich family, but all the records found so far show the family living in Greenwich and other parts of South London. Kate Maxwell duly gave John Blair Wills permission to marry Mary Ann, who was then barely 17 years old, and on the 24th of March, 1855, at St. Mark's Church in Kennington, they were pronounced man and wife. Their initial happiness was not to last. A daughter was born in the summer of 1856, and soon after, Mary Ann became ill with what's described as milk fever. Her condition was obviously more than the average case of mastitis, as she was sent to the Bethlehem Hospital, what was commonly known as Bedlam, in St. George's Fields in Southwark. 
Generally, doctors recommended that women be treated at home. The treatment might include purgatives, warm baths, and opiates. Restraint might be employed if a woman was violent. Dr. Alexander Morrison, who worked at the Bethlehem Hospital, warned in his outline of lectures on the nature causes and treatment of insanity that removal from home in cases of recent delivery may not be practicable and, where not required by the features of the case, is hardly advisable. A year later, the hospital decided that Mary Ann should be discharged to her family, although it was admitted that she was not completely better, perhaps because nobody was paying for her keep. Mary Ann must have been surprised to find James Fenton, her mustachioed brother-in-law, waiting to take her home on Monday the 3rd of August, 1857. James may have been a stranger to the girl as he appears to have traveled to Australia where he married a woman called Carolyn Grinier in 1856 and only returned to the family home as a widower in 1857. Back in her mother-in-law's house, Mary Ann asked the obvious question, where were her husband and daughter? No answer was forthcoming from her mother-in-law, Janet, or from her brother-in-law. After a few days of demanding an answer, she was summoned by John Blair Wills to an address in the city. He coldly told the poor girl that he did not want her and that she was not actually his wife, as he had been married to a woman called Anne Good since 1851. This terrible and shaming news would have devastated Mary Ann not only because she would be judged as someone guilty of fornication and living in sin, but also because her poor child was illegitimate. Helpfully, John Blair Wills suggested a solution, namely that the best thing she could do was to marry his brother, James Fenton, he of the mustaches, who seemed to be quite fond of her. To prove that there was no reason for them not to marry, John produced his and Anne's marriage certificate from 1851. Although some might think that Mary Ann was sullied, she was still a free woman and, as James was a widower, they could make a bad situation better. James's motives in all this are hard to discern. Possibly he was genuinely in love with Mary Ann, her physical charms are frequently mentioned. Perhaps he was completely under John's thumb and he was just doing what he was told. He was obviously aware that there was something not quite right as he registered the marriage as between him and Mary Ann Wells, a spinster aged 20. Mary Ann was in fact 19. He also lied in saying that Mary Ann's mother had given her permission for the nuptials. On Friday, the 21st of August, 1857, barely three weeks out of a lunatic asylum, not yet cured, abandoned by her seducer, deprived of her child, Mary Ann married James. Ironically, a week later, the Matrimonial Causes Act made it legal to get a divorce in the United Kingdom without needing parliamentary approval. The murky truth began to be revealed when Mary Ann's family were told of the new marriage and objected to it. They challenged John's claims that he was not legally married to Mary Ann and questioned the propriety, even if they were not married, of marrying the brother of her seducer and father of her child. Not surprisingly, Mary Ann was taken ill again and was admitted to the infirmary attached to the Lambeth workhouse. When James was asked to pay for his wife's treatment, he refused. Mary Ann must have felt that she had not escaped Bedlam after all when she was told that a second Wills brother denied being her husband, not because he was already married, but because she was. John's claim to have married in 1851 was found to be untrue. His marriage to Mary Ann was not bigamous. She was his legal wife and her child was legitimate. But in the meantime, encouraged by the blackguardedly John Blair Wills, she had contracted a bigamous and incestuous relationship with his brother James Wills. The 1835 Marriage Act made it quite clear that even marriage to a dead woman's sister was illegal, so marriage to a living man's brother most certainly was as well. When James was summoned before the court for making untruthful statements, it was obvious that he was not the most wicked of the Wills brothers. While Mary Ann had been locked in Bedlam in 1856, not in 1851, John had made the acquaintance of a young woman called Anne Good Matthews, and in April 1857 he had married her. Ignoring the fact that he had a living wife, he had described himself as a widower, indicating that he had no intention of returning to Mary Anne. To complicate matters further, Anne said that she was a widow. She was not. Her husband Edgar, a policeman, was also still alive. In 1858, not to be outdone, Edgar himself appears to have married bigamously. So we have 
three bigamous marriages – John to Anne, James to Mary Ann, Edgar to an unknown woman and an incestuous marriage, James to Mary Ann. No wonder the newspapers of the day reported this case in detail. When summoned to court, neither John nor James appeared, and they forfeited the 160 pounds bail that they had put up for James. What happened to John Blair Wills is a bit of a mystery. The newspapers said that he traveled to Philadelphia by way of New York on the 22nd of November. Taking the name of John Goddard and passing himself off as a surgeon, he was accompanied by a woman who answered to the description of Anne Good and a three-year-old child. James Fenton Wills avoided connection with the scandal by returning to Australia. He married his third wife, Maria, in 1862, and with her had three children. He probably never saw his mother, Janet, again. To avoid the scandal, she moved north of the river to Upper Holloway with her daughters. She died in 1875, leaving under 450 pounds. The deserted and destitute Marianne was visited in Lambeth Infirmary by Lord Raynham and his mother, the Marchioness of Townsend. Touched by her terrible experiences and representing a charity, Raynham gave her an allowance of ten shillings a week. Afterwards, Marianne went back to live with her mother in Norwood. The bath connection may have been put about as a red herring to protect the family's privacy. In 1861, they were living in Crown Cottage in semi-rural Norwood, where Kate was working as a dealer in fancy glass in China. One might think that after all that had happened to her, Marianne would not trust another man enough to marry him. But she was made of sterner stuff, and some time later, she met a widowed solicitor by the name of Thomas Hill. Possibly family connections played a part, as Marianne's maternal grandfather and Thomas's father-in-law were both shipwrights. But again, Thomas might just have spotted her in the street as Marianne is always described as being exceedingly attractive. In 1865, Marianne became Thomas's wife. They traveled to Jersey and married by license, perhaps to avoid any unfortunate publicity, or possibly because Marianne was actually still married to John. I've not found any evidence of a divorce or annulment. Marianne was stepmother to Thomas's five children, and three years later, she had a son of her own, Thomas Herbert Maxwell. Sadly, Marianne did not live a long and happy life. She was dead before 1881, when Herbert was only 12 years old. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please tell somebody about it who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do and tell them where they can listen to the show so they can tune in next weekend. If you missed any part of tonight's show, or if you'd like to hear it again, you can subscribe to the podcast in your favorite podcast app by searching for Weird Darkness. By doing that, you'll get a copy of tonight's show plus daily podcast episodes that come out seven days per week. Visit WeirdDarkness.com and you can follow me on social media, drop me an email, send me your own true paranormal story, listen to other podcasts that I host, and more. All stories used tonight are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the stories or the authors in the show notes, which I've already posted at WeirdDarkness.com. The Korean War UFO is by Natasha Frost for History.com. The Castletown Roche Murders is by Finn Dwyer for The Irish Examiner. The Arizona Skinwalker was written by Stephen Wagner for Live About. And Bigamous Blair is from London Overlooked. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. 1 John 1 verse 5b – God is light. In Him there is no darkness at all. And a final thought. Every day is a new beginning. Take a deep breath and start again. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the weird darkness.
No matter the time of day or season, sometimes you need to find a way to rid yourself of those ghostly chills that bring raised hairs and goosebumps to your skin. Other times you're looking for those ghostly chills. Either way, it sounds like you need a mug of Weird Dark Roast Coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee has deep notes of cocoa, caramel, and a touch of sinister sweetness that'll send shivers down your taste buds. This is an exclusive coffee that I selected specifically for you, my weirdo family. Weird Dark Roast is not available in stores, coffee houses, mad scientist labs, or even the dark web, but you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee – fresh roasted to order so it's as fresh as it can be when it lands on your doorstep and knocks three times. Grab yours now at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee does not actually knock on your door because it doesn't have arms or hands, so if you hear knocks at the door and no one answers when you ask who it is, it's probably paranormal and you should just leave the door shut and locked. The people of the Middle Ages have a reputation for wanton brutality, and, as supposed evidence of this, countless instruments of torture sit in museums around the world, arguably the most famous of which being the Iron Maiden. This hellish contraption supposedly caused unthinkable pain and anguish for those unlucky enough to be sentenced to suffer its merciless sting, condemning them to a slow and agonizing death or at least that's what the stories say. Because as far as anyone can tell, the Iron Maiden didn't exist as a real-world object until the 19th century, and for reference here, the so-called medieval times are generally considered to have ended around the end of the 15th century. So who invented the Iron Maiden, and why? How did it become the face of medieval torture, and has anyone actually ever been killed in one? As for historical examples, there are a couple references to similar devices in history, with the oldest being a device known today as the Iron Apega, supposedly made about 2200 years ago. Described by Greek historian Polybius, the device was an automaton replica of the wife of 2nd and 3rd century BC Spartan leader Nabus, with the woman in question named, you guessed it, Apega. The automaton was apparently lavishly dressed up in one of Apega's outfits, with Polybius then stating of those who were made to meet the wife replica, "...when the man offered her his hand, he made the woman rise from her chair, and taking her in his arms drew her gradually to his bosom. Both her arms and hands as well as her breasts were covered with iron nails, so that when Navis rested his hands on her back and then by means of certain springs drew his victim toward her, he made the man thus embraced say anything and everything. Indeed, by this means he killed a considerable number of those who denied him money. So in a nutshell of the whole story, anyone who refused to pay their taxes would be made to give this mechanical version of his wife a hug, with at any point them being able to make the hug of death stop if they agreed to pay. If they did not, the hug continued until they died. Whether this device actually existed or not, or was just an allusion to Apega's supposedly ruthless nature to match the reported cruelty of her husband, isn't known. Moving on from there, we have an account from one of the earliest Christian authors and the so-called father of Latin Christianity, Tertullian, who lived in the 2nd and 3rd century AD. In his work, To the Martyrs, he states of the death of Roman general and consul Marcus Atilius Regulus, it would take me too long to enumerate one by one the men who at their own self-impulse have put an end to themselves. Regulus, a Roman general who had been taken prisoner by the Carthaginians, declined to be exchanged for a large number of Carthaginian captives, choosing rather to give back to the enemy. He was crammed into a sort of chest, and everywhere pierced by nails, driven from the outside, he endured so many crucifixions. A follow-up account by Augustine of Hippo in his 5th century City of God elaborates on the tale of Regulus's death. Marcus Attilus Regulus, a Roman general, was a prisoner in the hands of the Carthaginians, but they, being more anxious to exchange their prisoners with the Romans than to keep them, 
sent Regulus as a special envoy with their own ambassadors to negotiate this exchange, but bound him first with an oath that if he failed to accomplish their wish, he would return to Carthage. He went and persuaded the Senate to the opposite course, because he believed it was not for the advantage of the Roman Republic to make an exchange of prisoners. After he had thus exerted his influence, the Romans did not compel him to return to the enemy, but what he had sworn he voluntarily performed. But the Carthaginians put him to death with refined, elaborate, and horrible tortures. They shut him up in a narrow box in which he was compelled to stand, and in which finely sharpened nails were fixed all around about him, so that he could not lean upon any part of it without intense pain. And so they killed him by depriving him of sleep. That said, whether any of that actually happened or not is up for debate, as first century BC Greek historian Diodorus claims Regulus died of natural causes, with no mention of such a torture device involved. Moving on from there are old European fairy tales of unknown dating and origin in which certain individuals were killed by being placed inside casks that had nails driven in. The cask would then apparently be rolled down a steep hill, sometimes into water, which, if we're being honest, almost sounds worse than the actual Iron Maiden. Sort of the spiked version of death by a thousand paper cuts, and then as a reward at the end, terrifying slow drowning as you writhe in agony from all the little holes in your body. No doubt also trying to reflexively break the cask to get out once it starts to fill with water, creating some more holes in the process. We suppose at least this one's a bit quicker, if a lot more dramatic. Other than that, there are no references to such an Iron Maiden-like device until just before the 19th century. This first reference comes from German philosopher, linguist, archaeologist, and professor at the University of Altdorf, Johann Philipp Sabinkis, in 1793. According to Sabinkis, on August 14, 1515, a coin forger was sentenced to die in a casket that had metal spikes driven into various parts lined up with particularly sensitive bits of the forger's anatomy. Writes Sabenkis, the very sharp points penetrated his arms and his legs in several places, and his belly and chest, and his bladder, and the root of his member, that would be the penis, and his eyes and his shoulders and his buttocks, but not enough to kill him, and so he remained making great cry and lament for two days, after which he died. Of course, if this was a real method of execution used, each such cask would have had to have been custom spiked for each new victim in order to line everything up perfectly, given people come in all shapes and sizes. This creates something of a logistical problem that many other means of torturing and killing somebody wouldn't have. Nevertheless, Sabenkis claimed it happened, at least this once. So, did it? Well, given the complete lack of evidence or even reference to any other such Iron Maiden-like device used elsewhere in the era, nor who this forger was or any such pertinent details other than the oddly specific date, most historians think he made it up, or that this was an exaggerated tale of the use of a device that we do know existed in Europe. So what was this real instrument of torture? Sometimes called the shant mantle or coat of shame, the drunkard's cloak, or the Spanish mantle, this was essentially a wooden cask someone who was being punished for some crime would be made to wear about town. Sort of a mobile version of stocks with similar purpose, mocking someone publicly and having people throw random things at them, in this case as they trudged along. Consider this account from Ralph Gardier's 17th century England's Grievance Discovered. Men drove up and down the streets with a great tub or barrel opened in the sides, with a hole in one end to put through their heads and to cover their shoulders and bodies, down to the small of their legs, and then close the same, called the new-fashioned cloak, and so make them march to the view of all beholders, and this is their punishment for drunkards or the like. Jumping across the pond to the land of the free, at least some soldiers were not always so free, as noted in an article titled, a Look at the Federal Army, published in 1862, where the author states, I was extremely amused to see a rare specimen of Yankee invention, in the shape of an original method of punishment drill. One wretched delinquent was gratuitously framed in oak, his head being thrust through a hole cut in one end of a barrel, the other end of which had been removed, and the poor fellow loafed about in the most disconsolate manner, looking for all the world like a half-hatched chicken. 
In another account by one John Howard in 1784, in his The State of Prisons in England and Wales, he writes, Denmark, some of the lower sort as watchmen, coachmen, etc., are punished by being led through the city in what's called the Spanish mantle. This is a kind of heavy vest, something like a tub, with an aperture for the head and irons to enclose the neck. I measured one at Berlin, 1 foot 8 inches in diameter at the top, 2 feet 11 inches at the bottom, and 2 feet 11 inches high. This mode of punishment is particularly dreaded and is one cause that night robberies are never heard of in Copenhagen. Of course, much like the Iron Maiden, as you'll note from the dates mentioned here, most detailed contemporary accounts of these devices of humiliation and sometimes torture seem to indicate they weren't really a medieval thing, despite sometimes claiming to go back to the 13th century in Germany. In any event, whether Sibenki's much more elaborate cask with spikes put in was really just a tale he picked up that was exaggerating these coats of shame, he made it up completely, or whether some inventive executioner thought to add the addition of spikes to such a cask and a forger really was executed in this way in the 16th century isn't known, with most leaning towards Sibenki's making it up. Even if it did really happen, however, this still is post-medieval times by most people's reckoning. Whatever the case, a handful of years after Sabenki's account, the first known actual Iron Maiden appeared in Nuremberg Museum in 1802, not far away from Sabenki's home in Aldorf. This device was supposedly discovered in a German castle in the late 18th century. Not just a cask, this killing machine was roughly human-shaped, made of iron, and even had a face supposedly based on the face of the Virgin Mary, hence the torture instrument's name, the Iron Maiden. This probably first real Iron Maiden was sadly destroyed during World War II by Allied bombers, but a copy created as decoration for the Gothic Hall of a patrician palace in Milan in 1828 survived and currently resides in the Rothenburg das Kriminal Museum, Museum of Crime. From this copy, we can see that the device was certainly designed to cause unimaginable agony in its victims. Along with having strategically placed spikes designed to pierce approximately where a person's vital organs and sensitive nether region dangly bits are, the face of the maiden did indeed have spikes designed to pierce a victim's eyes upon closing, assuming the person wasn't vertically challenged. This copy did a lot to help popularize the idea of the Iron Maiden as a real thing thanks to its prominent display at the World's Columbian Exposition in 1893 in Chicago and subsequent tour across the United States to much fanfare. Incidentally, this was the same World's Fair that gave us the name Ferris Wheel for a device previously called a Pleasure Wheel, with George Washington Gale Ferris Jr.'s iconic version being rather massive compared to anything that had come before, holding an astounding 2,160 people at a time. This was also the same fair that saw famed serial killer H. H. Holmes taking advantage of the extra people in town looking for a place to stay, keeping business booming at his so-called House of Horrors hotel. Going back to the Iron Maiden, beyond the tour of one of the originals and extra exposure at the World's Fair, another man largely credited with popularizing the idea of the Iron Maiden was 19th century art collector Matthew Peacock. Among other things, he managed to collect a wide variety of historic torture devices to, as he put it, show the dark spirit of the Middle Ages in contrast to the progress of humanity. You see, at the time it was in vogue to not just act like people from medieval times were all scientific rubes, which is where the myth that people in medieval times thought that the world was flat came from, despite all evidence to the contrary, but also that they were extremely barbaric with the Iron Maiden creating a rather nice illustration of this supposed fact. Naturally, unable to find the real McCoy, Peacock cobbled together an Iron Maiden apparently partially from real artifacts of other means of torture and then donated it to a museum to be displayed as a symbolic representation of the former era's cruelty. The public ate all of this up, and the idea of the Iron Maiden slowly permeated throughout society to the point that most today assume it was a real thing used to kill people in a slow and very painful way during medieval times. This all brings us the question of whether anyone has ever actually been tortured or killed in one. The answer, surprisingly, is 
possibly, but not in medieval times, nor even apparently in historic ones unless you consider a couple decades ago historic. Enter Uday Hussein, the eldest son of Saddam, started his murderous rampage apparently by bludgeoning to death one Kamel Gageo, who was at the time Saddam's bodyguard, valet, and food taster. This murder was done in front of a host of party guests in 1988. The party in question was in Egypt, in honor of Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak's wife, Suzanne. As to what Giorgio did to incite Uday's rage, he apparently hooked Saddam up with a woman, Samira Shabandar. Samira was married when Saddam met her, but that was quickly taken care of, freeing him up to take her as one of his mistresses and later as his second wife. While still in the mistress stage, Uday decided to kill Gageo for the facilitation of Saddam's illicit relationship, which Uday seems to have felt was an affront to his own mother. Saddam did sentence his son to death for this murder, but a few months later switched to exiling him to Switzerland, with the Swiss government allowing the well-known recent murderer to enter the country for some bizarre reason. However, after frequent run-ins with the law there, the Swiss finally gave him the boot and he returned to Iraq without apparent consequence. If all that wasn't enough of a testament of what a swell fella Uday was, beyond some confirmed assassination attempts and other murders by the lovable rapscallion, rumors of frequent rape of random women swirled around Uday. This all brings us back to the Iron Maiden and Uday's eventual appointment as the chairman of the Iraqi Olympic Committee and the Iraq Football Association. In those positions, accusations were rampant that Uday occasionally had various athletes tortured when they were thought to have either underperformed or otherwise screwed up in some way in competition. These included doing things like ripping their toenails off, scalding their feet, subjecting them to extreme sleep deprivation, having them kick cement balls, and dragged across gravel roads followed by being dipped into sewage. Allegedly, after a 4-1 to loss to Japan in the Asian Cup in 2000, he also had three of the players deemed responsible for the defeat beaten repeatedly for a few days. As for the Iron Maiden, after Uday's death and the fall of Saddam's regime in 2003, a mere 20 or so meters away from the Iraqi Football Association headquarters, an Iron Maiden was found on the ground. Time Magazine's Bobby Gosh states of this find, "...the one found in Baghdad was clearly worn from use, its nails having lost some of their sharpness. It lay on its side within view of Uday's first-floor offices in the Soccer Association." Ironically, the torture device was brought to Time's attention by a group of looters who had been stripping the compound of anything of value. They had left behind the Iron Maiden, believing it to be worthless. That said, despite this report, there's no actual hard evidence the Iron Maiden was used, nor blood found on the device or the like. But given all the rumors of Uday's penchant for torturing people and some of the confirmed things he did do, as well as the device's location, at the least, he is presumed to have used it as a method of terrorizing people, as was more the norm even in medieval times with actual real-world torture devices rather than frequently using them. All that said, given his proclivities for murdering people who upset him, it's further speculated by many that he might have actually followed through and killed someone with it at some point. But again, despite reports, so far there has never been any concrete evidence of this so it's still not wholly clear if anyone was ever actually killed by an Iron Maiden or not. Sudden death over time, your darkness.